want to do a trip next year. We're going to go. <clears throat> okay, we're, we're back. We're, are we back? Are we back? Yes, we're back. I got it from, I got it from the rabbi. Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski. Here we are on uh, what Community Matters. And we're going to talk about a Jewish holiday that's coming up. It's very important that we know about all these holidays. There are one, you know, every holiday, every, what, few weeks or months or so. And uh, the one that's coming up even this week, the, the 9th and the 10th, uh, of June, is it? Yes, uh, is Sunday, Sh Monday. Sunday, Monday is Shvos, right. or Shvuat, as you like. The, uh, we'll talk about the pronunciation. Welcome to the show, Rabbi. Well, thank you, Jay. As always, it's a pleasure, and uh, it's great to be here, especially to talk about such an important holiday as Shavuos. Yeah. Well, let me make some guesses. It's about, it's a celebration of the Torah. Uh, it's a happy holiday. Um, it's the Pentecost, you mentioned to me. I'm not sure what that is. Um, can you tell us more about Shavuot, Shavuos? Sure. So in Hebrew, the word Shavuot means a week. <clears throat> and in the Torah, in the Bible, it says that when the Jewish people left Egypt, they counted seven weeks from when they left <clears throat> for 49 days. And on the 50th day, God came down on Mount Sinai and gave uh, Moses uh, the Torah, which is encapsulated in the Ten Commandments. And um, this happened on Shavuos. So it's a, basically the holiday commemorates our receiving of the Torah. So what, what days does it fall on the Hebrew calendar then? It falls out on the sixth and the seventh day of the third Hebrew month of Sivan. And, and it's the same every year yeah. on that day. Now, what's interesting is that when Moses was first sent to Egypt to let the people know and to instruct Pharaoh, let my people go, uh, God told Moses to tell the Jewish people that when you will leave Egypt, you will serve me, God, on the mountain, referring to the giving of the Torah. In other words, Passover represents freedom. We were liberated from Egypt. But freedom is not the end goal. Freedom is just the, the uh, environment that one needs to be in to be able to realize their goals. The goal is Shavuos. The goal is to receive the Torah. The Torah is the destination and the, uh, and the, and the compass, our, our uh, GPS, our spiritual GPS that guides us. And in that way, uh, the holiday of Shavuos is the pinnacle of Jewish holidays. Ah, the pinnacle. And, and receive. What does receive mean? Of course, you receive the Torah from God. But you also distribute the Torah. You, you advance right. the Torah. You right. uh, pass it on. You pass Share. it on, yeah. Share. Tell us how that works. Well, so basically the Torah, which is the Hebrew word for the Bible, um, is God's word, God's teachings. And as explained in the mystical teachings of the Torah, it's God's wisdom embedded in the Torah. Basically, God put us here in this world and didn't just let us uh, figure things out uh, uh, on our own, through our own devices, but gave us a manual. And the manual uh, uh, guides us, teaches us how to, how to use all the parts and how to optimally uh, put, you know, how to live life optimally. So that's how we, that's how we view the Torah. The Torah is not just a book of laws not just a book of history. It is basically uh, our guiding light and teaches us the meaning of life, the purpose of life, and in every situation, um, how, how, how to conduct oneself. So mm. in, in the Bible, the Torah is referred to as Torah or the Torah of light. Because the Torah illuminates you know, if you're sitting in a dark room, you could be sitting surrounded by treasures, but in a dark room, you have no clue. Uh, you don't see them. 
switch on the light, then you see what's in the room. In the same way also, a person uh, can go through life and be in a dark place and not see their own worth, their own riches, their own purpose, not understand um, uh, what life is all about. The Torah teaches us all of that. Mm. Let me throw a, a theory at you yeah. and tell me, you know, if this is consistent and right in terms of the, the Jewish way of looking at it. Uh, to, to go from what you said, seems like to me, um, the Torah, it's not only a, a pathway for your own self and for the way you lead your life, but it, it puts you in a larger landscape. It puts you in perspective in, in the world. Because, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes it doesn't work so well, like in the Holocaust, for an individual who may lose his life for the wrong reason, or in these murders in synagogues and the like. Um, but you, you still need to look at things from the big picture. So it's not just that you lead your life better. Tell me if I'm right. Um, but it helps you participate in the, the larger picture and be more comfortable in the larger picture, however your individual life is going. Am I right? I believe that's correct. Uh, see, the Torah, the other adjective description of the Torah in the scripture in the, in the Bible is that it is Torah's emes. It's the Torah of truth. Meaning, it being God's word, so everything uh, that's, all the teachings in the Torah are expressions of truth. Eternal truth. So, yes, the Torah guides us in our individual path. Uh, because when it manifests itself for the individual, it, 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 uh, it um, uh, carries the message of truth for the individual. And the same is also true in the bigger perspective, that the Torah opens up our eyes and helps us understand the purpose of creation, you know, everything about life and this world, in this world. Mm. That's what I was kind of yeah, getting right, at. Yeah, right, right there. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting, too, that uh, the last couple of times we met, uh, we talked about Passover, which is in a right. only, what, a month ago or so? Yes. Um, and, Almost uh, two months ago. Two, sorry. See how things get away with Time <laughs> gets away with us. Um, and it uh, seems like this is the next holiday that you and I are talking about, and it involves uh, going through the desert. It involves receiving the Torah in the desert, Moses, all that. Um, so there's a sort of, there's sort of a, linear, a linear historical statement here. Yes. On, on Passover, you leave. On Shavuos, you receive the Torah. Shavuos, you, uh, Shavuos you're told, you're given your mission statement. <laughs> okay. So let me just share a couple of interesting uh, things about the Torah, the giving of the Torah, and specifically about uh, what sets the Jewish religion apart from uh, almost all other religions in the world. And that is, all the other religions in the world are pretty much come down to a matter of faith. You either believe or you don't believe. So for example, in Christianity, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, it is said that Jesus uh, was with his disciples and then he went off. He came back and he said that he had a vision from God or he had a message from God and, and he became, you know, the preacher of, of that truth or that, that message. Whether in fact he had, a mess, he had a vision from God or not, that's a matter of faith. The, those who believe, believe he did. And those who are skeptical or don't believe, don't believe. And that's true for all other religions, uh, the, 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 the Muslim religion as well. Judaism makes an entire different claim. Judaism doesn't say the God that Moses went on top of a mountain and came down saying, this is what God gave me. Judaism claims that in the presence of several million people, all of the Jewish people at that time, God came down on Mount Sinai and gave and spoke the Ten Commandments and gave the Ten Tablets to Moses to bring down from the mountain. 
Now, so basically the Torah claims, or the Judaism claims, this event as a historical event. Now, how do me and you know that George Washington lived and wasn't a fictitious figure? We know it because had he been a fictitious figure, he would have come down to us in the history books that no, George Washington never really lived, it was all a hoax or whatever. If this claim was not true, that God came down in the presence of millions and millions of people, then it would have come down to us that this is the claim, but other hundreds of thousands of people who lived in that time said it's never happened. So for us, this is an historical truth. It's not based on faith. It seems to be unanimous in the, in the writings. Right. As it come, this is how it was passed down to us from generation to generation. So th this is how truths are established. So again, so this is, so Judaism is not based on, on, on believing Moses' word. It's based on this historical truth. Now, the teachings of the Torah is based on faith plays a very important role, faith in God. God is not something we can touch or feel. Uh, it's beyond any of, uh, you know, it can be quantified and it can be uh, proven, you know, with, through our senses. Uh, so, um, so the mind, God gave us an intellect, a mind, and the mind, uh, uh, when it contemplates and reflects and meditates, could come to the conclusion that what, what they call intelligent design, that this whole world, which is so intricate and every aspect of it is so amazing, to suggest that it just happened to be, there was a big bang and it all came into being, makes no sense. It would be the equivalent of suggesting that uh, Shakespeare's plays were written by throwing ink you know, <laughs> on a tablet and it just came out that way. But obviously, that never happened. So the Torah does um, uh, uh, require us to use our intellect to come to the, to conclude, to come to the realization that there is a creator, that there is a God. In fact, the first Jewish person, Abraham, came to that realization through intellectual contemplation. The, the Talmud says that he, reflect, he looked at the world. During the day, he thought, Sun was God, and at night he realized when the sun wasn't there and yet the world still existed, that the moon was God, until he realized that there is a higher being that uh, uh, created all of this. However, the intellect, as, as, as powerful as it is, has its limitations. So you mentioned before uh, the Holocaust. So how does the intellect accept God, a God, that allows for such suffering? or even individual suffering and all the other big, big questions that we have about life in, in this world. So that's where faith kicks in. And faith basically tells us, just like a colorblind person who can't tell the difference of colors, uh, realizes that the deficiency is in his inability to see the different colors. In the same way also, the intellect itself it, it can accept that it's only a finite tool and cannot therefore uh, uh, assume that it can understand everything and what it doesn't understand, it doesn't exist. Well, there's a humility in that, isn't there? That is true. And I think humility has to be built into the people. They have to exactly. appreciate, they have to have a certain humility. Exactly. So, by the way, in the Ethics of Our Fathers, which is one of the uh, ethical teachings of the Torah, it says, who is a wise man? He who learns from all people. It doesn't say he who has a PhD from Harvard <laughs> or he who has an IQ, you know, above average. A wise man, a smart man, is someone who has the humility uh, to learn from everyone and everything. A you feel that? Do you feel a that? Whole, a whole different you feel, uh, perspective. I feel that. Yeah? I, I, that really well, life it. teaches you at some point. When, when, you, when you're yeah. young... You know, you think that, you know, you uh, have it all figured out and you follow your, you know, your understanding of things. But as you grow older and you, and you come up with certain things in life, you learn. Yeah. 
Let's take a short break. Uh, that's Rabbi uh, Itchel Krasnjanski of Chabad, Hawaii. And we're talking about Shavuos, uh, my pronunciation. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> of the holiday, Ashkenazi uh, yes. pronunciation. And uh, it's a holiday coming later this week. Yes. Uh, the Sunday and Monday. Correct. Uh, a very interesting holiday. When we come back, we'll talk about exactly what you do and how you celebrate Shavuos. Sure. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Lauren Pear, a host here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you'd go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks so much. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Tim Abicella. We are hosts here at Think Tech Hawaii, a digital media company serving the people of Hawaii. We provide a video platform for citizen journalists to raise public awareness in Hawaii. We are a Hawaii nonprofit that depends on the generosity of its supporters to keep on going. We'd be grateful if you go to thinktechhawaii.com and make a donation to support us now. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much. We're back with uh, Community Matters, uh, Itchel Krasnjanski, the rabbi of Chabad of Hawaii, and uh, so, so honored to have him here and so happy to be able to talk about Shavuos with him. Um, and Shavuos, you, you talked about the Torah and you talked about reading from the Torah, and every week, every Shabbos, which is Saturday in the Jewish religion, uh, there's a different reading through the year. Um, and the, undoubtedly, there's a reading this Saturday from the Torah has a lot to do with Shavuos. What is that reading? What's it about? Well, like we said before, Shavuos is on Sunday and Monday. So the reading on Sunday, which is the main day of the holiday, mm -hmm. is we actually read of the giving of the Torah, the story of the Ten, Command Ten Commandments, where the Jews were, were, were gathered around Mount Sinai, and then Moses goes up the mountain, and God comes down and he speaks the Ten Commandments. And uh, so this is the reading that we, uh, that we do in the synagogue and the shul uh, every Shavuos. Interestingly, just to like uh, a little off on a tangent, if you look at the Ten Commandments, which, which the commentaries tell us really contain within it the entire body and the entire teaching of the entire Torah. As we know, there are 613 commandments in the Torah, 248 positive ones, you shall do this, you shall do that, and 365 thou shalt not. What you shouldn't do, by the way, is more than what you should do. There's more of what you shouldn't do than what you should do. All of it is contained in the Ten Commandments. However, just on the surface, if you read the Ten Commandments, you find something very, 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 very interesting. And that is, you know, usually the Ten Commandments is five on one side and five on the other side, five to the right and five to the left. The first of the Ten Commandments is, I am the Lord your God who has taken you out of Egypt. Basically, it, it, is, the, um, it is the whole idea of, of faith in God, which we touched upon a moment ago. And then, the second one is not to, have, not to do any idol worship and things like that. So they're basically theological uh, uh, teachings that uh, are the basis and foundation of our world view. The second set of tablets, the second five, are not to, not, not, not to murder, uh, not to steal, um, um, not to um, live with uh, another woman, uh, well, I forget the term for that. And the last one is not to covet, not to desire that which is not yours. So the question is, the commentaries point out, that the contrast between the first five commandments and the second five commandments is, seems to be so, so great. The first five are you know, really deep theological truisms, and the second five are moral ethical 101, moral ethics 101. I mean, it's, like, it's such a big contrast. So really the question is, can a person be truly moral and ethical without accepting the religious 
theological underpinnings of, uh, uh, of these teachings. On the left side. Yeah, yeah. Can a person can follow the right side? Can you follow the left side, which are the moral, uh, ethical teachings, without accepting uh, the right side? Okay. And there are, in fact, many people who will tell you, you know, that they live an ethical life, uh, but they are not religious. They don't even believe in God or whatever. Um, what, what claim does religion have to suggest that these two are interlinked? That really, that you shall not steal, not because it's, it's, it violates your ethical uh, sensibilities, but you shall not steal because God in the, in the Torah says thou shalt not steal. Basically, it's, it's accepting this higher authority. So the Rebbe would point out to something very, very interesting, and that is, look at Germany. Germany was a very cultured nation. Music, philosophy, they had all these philosophers and big musicians and science, and they were advanced. And then, as we know, they turned into the most uh, barbaric, the Nazis, the most barbaric nation in the history of mankind. H how did they go from being so refined and, 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 and uh, you know, and um, quote-unquote uh, ethical and, you know, moral to becoming such uh, beasts? And the answer is that if we rely on our own uh, thinking without accepting a higher power, then our mind can play tricks on us. So uh, Hitler, may his name be erased, while he was very strong, I don't know if you know this, but while he was very strong about cruelty, against cruelty to animals, in Germany there were very, very harsh laws about being cruel to animals. But at the same time, in his mind, in his whole, the whole Nazi country, it was perfectly okay to murder and kill men, women, and children, Jewish men, women, and children, and others. In their thinking, they've come to uh, an understanding that they were an Aryan superior race, and to cleanse you know, the, the world from, uh, you know, from the inferiors, that's what they had to do. So their mind uh, le led them to this, to this conclusion. So for example, everybody will, will tell you, yeah, if you see a poor man walking the street that only has a piece of bread, for someone to come and steal that bread from that poor man, that's disgusting and who would, you know, you don't need to be a, a super religious person not to do that. But how about something more subtle? Like, for example, if you can get away with something, you know, um, in a way that no one will ever figure out, like fees that, that you're contractually obligated to pay the utility company, but you have a way of circumventing it. And you think to yourself, anyways, are they entitled to such big fees? I'm going to stick it to them. In that instance, a person may conclude that uh, it's okay, you know, and not lose too much sleep over it. So what the Torah teaches us is that, re real, that truly ethics and morals have to be based on the acceptance of a higher authority. And it's not something that you could uh, negotiate away. And we see even today, where, where are we today as a, as a society? The whole concept of moral relativism, that what is right or what is wrong is really determined by the parties involved. There's no absolute right or wrong. And that's pretty, uh, that seems a, a logical conclusion if you don't accept that there's a higher authority mm -hmm. that dictates. Which you, which you take on faith, ultimately. Yes. So, um, yeah, this, and it's very interesting that it, and the, the Torah is read at a service on Sunday. Right. And this reading is a reading of the, the handing down of the receiving of the Ten Commandments. Correct. And the Torah, essentially. Right. And so what it is, this is, this is probably the most interesting part of the Torah in the sense that this is the story of the Torah itself. So you read from the Torah about, am I right? Receiving the Torah. Correct. This has got to be a unique 
day for reading the Torah on Sunday. Yes, as a matter of fact, um, the Talmud says that when God was going to give the Torah, uh, he asked of the Jewish people for guarantors that they would uh, <laughs> faithfully keep the Torah. So first, the Medrash says, as the oral tradition, that they said, oh, our parents will be our guarantors. And God said, not good enough. And he said some other suggestions. So they said, our children will be our guarantors. In other words, we guarantee that we will pass it on to our children. And um, then and God accepted that. So the custom is that on the holiday of Shavuos, especially the children, they all come to synagogue and, and, and are present when the Torah is read with the giving of the Ten Commandments. Because the emphasis in Judaism, interestingly enough, is on the future, not on the past, even though it's rich in its traditions and the whole idea of, you know, of, of, of being connected to our past, but the focus and the emphasis is on the future. Mm -hmm. I, Rabbi, it reminds me of the story of uh, Ben Franklin, who was in Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and they were in there, um, you know, having this, this, uh, this meeting about designing the government to follow whatever government that would be, and they weren't telling anybody exactly what they were talking about. There was a woman outside, and she waited for them to, to break their meeting, and as he walked out, she approached him, and she said, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what kind of a government are we going to have? Okay, and he said, and I quote, we are going to have a republic, madam, if you can keep it. <laughs> the burden is on you to right. keep it. Yes. So it's this whole notion of keeping it and having a guarantor who promises to keep it going forward. You need that in order to perpetuate, um, you know, the, the value there. Same thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's another interesting aspect, uh, and this, this touches upon, as you know, within the Jewish community, within the Jewish nation, we have basically in America three main streams of Judaism, quote-unquote orthodox, conservative, and reform. And the theological difference between them relates to the giving of the Ten Commandments. And that is that in the orthodox, which Chabad is part of the orthodox group, in other words, it adheres to the Torah and the mitzvahs, it believes that God's word are eternal and are eternally binding, so even though that society changes and life changes, but God's truths are, uh, are uh, for all time. So today we keep, if Moses woke up and he walked into an orthodox shul, he, he would feel very at home because it would be, everything is done the exact same way that uh, he taught. So um, the, 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 the the basis for that is our belief that the Torah is God's word. The Torah is from heaven, it's God's word. Moses was just a stenographer. Moses was just the messenger to deliver God's word. And because it was God's word, it is God's word, then it's, it's eternal, just as God is eternal. And it, it's, it's, it's um, infinite in its depth meaning layers upon layers upon layers of meaning. The conservative movement um, believes that Moses, who was a very inspired person, who was, very, who was like prophet-like, or a prophet, very inspired person, the Torah are his words, the Torah are his teachings, written down, being inspired by God, but it's not God's word. And therefore, uh, it calls for change. You know, when, when the realities on the ground change, then it calls for change. So for example, in the Bible, in the Torah, there's a lot about keeping kosher, meaning the, the foods that you eat have to be only from certain animals, have to be slaughtered and prepared in a certain way. Well, the, the way in which the Torah says, it to be prepared uh, health-wise, 
protected the Jews from a lot of uh, disease, disease and plagues, over the years, yeah. right? Okay. Disease and plagues, etc. Basic hygiene. Basic hygiene. So in that, in, at that time, they argue, it was very necessary. But today, in modern, in the modern world, where the hygiene, you know, the government uh, inspects everything, and you have all of these agencies making sure, there's really no need to keep to the strict kosher dietary laws. Things have changed. Things yeah. have changed. What's the third one? Oh, the third one is Reform Judaism. Reform Judaism is, is I be, I'm not an expert on it, but Reform Judaism bas basically, you know, you, okay. Reform Judaism, the emphasis is on the ethical teachings of the Torah. That's really the whole message of Judaism. All the other elements of Torah, the ritual of our Torah, they uh, pretty much discard. And they say, you know, uh, man is left to choose whether he wants to uh, abide by it or accept it or not. Uh, as a matter of fact, as part of the reform platform, uh, it's not even required to have faith in God, to believe that God exists. You can be an, uh, uh, you can be an atheist and still be... As long as you're ethical. As long as you're ethical. And interesting. What's, and what's interesting is that... And that's relatively recent. Well, see, reform movement began in the, in the <clears throat> early 1800s in Germany. And it was actually a movement to break away from traditional Judaism. And it was an assimilationist movement to assimilate within <clears throat> society at that time. You know, I would really like to talk to you about this subject, about those three groups. Branches. And how they think, and not only how they think, but how they relate to each other within the group and among the groups and to the community because we should do you know, a, not a everybody whole. agrees on a lot of right. things. Um, we we, we got to go. And by the way, right within, right? within the Orthodox movement, Chabad, that I am part of and the Rebbe, is almost like a part of the Orthodox movement because we don't believe in all these labels. But the Rebbe taught us is that we're all Jews and we're all connected intrinsically together through our souls and our common destiny. And therefore, Chabad is, is totally colorblind when it comes to these labels. And that's why Chabad is so loved by the wider community. I know that from knowing you. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Itchel Krez and Jansky, we'll do this again soon uh, here on Community Matters. It's great to talk to you. Thank you, Jay. Always. Shalom. Shalom. Happy holidays. Happy Shavuos. <laughs>